Good to see all of you here, and glad that you're here. I'm Andy. I'm one of the guys on staff, and excited to get to know you if I could do that. So if today's one of your first days, or is your first day, would love to meet you afterwards. I'll be available. Just, just try to catch me afterwards. We're coming uh, today near the end of our summer series. Uh, we've been calling it Ordinary, looking at the ordinary lives of men and women through the pages of the Scripture. And if you notice on that video, every week it says all these different characters from the Bible, and then it also says you and I. Well, today's the you and I part. How does this apply to us, us ordinary men and women, and the role that we have to play? So we'll be getting to that in just a minute. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn those to Ephesians chapter 4. It's page 800 in these Bibles. should be one there in your seats. Uh, grab that, and we'll be there in just a minute. But before we get there, I want to give you some insider information that other, we'll be telling you more about over the next couple of weeks, but you guys get to hear it today uh, to kind of get you in the know. So we've been uh, growing as a church for quite a, quite a few years, and uh, we anticipate that continuing over these next months. And so to make space for that, we're going to make two significant shifts to our service times, which I think will help us out quite a bit. Uh, first of all, to provide more space, but also to give a more convenient option, we're going to be adding a fourth service in the fall at 6 o'clock. Now, if you were here a year or so ago, we had it one at 4 o'clock. We're trying it at 6 o'clock. We think it'll be a little better option, a little more convenient for everybody at 6. So if that's a convenient time for you, that'd be a great thing for you to consider. Uh, also, to give a little more space between this service and the following service, the third service, we're moving the next service back 10 minutes to 11.05. We think that'll make the children's ministry area a little less chaotic, make the parking lot a little less chaotic. We've actually had people who have come in for the third service, and because you guys are still there and they, they, new people are arriving and such, they'll come in. There's actually no spots available for them. And we've watched people, horrifyingly, drive through the parking lot, no, one's, no place is available for them, and they'll just pull out and, and, and leave. And um, it just it breaks our heart, honestly, a little bit, because we know how much nerve it takes if you're new to faith to kind of gear up your heart to try to check out something new like a church. So for you to get ready, get your kids ready, everybody get here, and then there's no spots available, that's just not okay. So this space will help us uh, make that work. Uh, now, you have friends that this will apply to. You know, you've got friends who maybe work in the mornings on Sunday, and, but they would they'd be available at 6 so you're saying, I, I can't invite them to, to the, the 935 service, or they're, they're working over here or there, or they're not available, or maybe they have a, a, night, a job that has them out late on Saturday nights, so it's just not convenient. Six o'clock on Sunday night would work well for them. Invite them, come with them. We'd love for you to, to do that. And also, if, if you're just willing to, to consider that service, moving out of this service to the six o'clock would be a ministry to our church, because we're going to run out of seats in this, in this facility, uh, in this room, uh, so that would really help us out. All of that starts the Sunday after Labor Day. So sep nothing changes between now and, sep and Labor Day, but starting September 8th, uh, the 6 p.m. service will start and the service will switch back 10 minutes to 11.05. Okay? That'd be awesome. Uh, have you ever been going through things, just going through your day or whatever, and you hear something on the news or you hear something on the radio and it just kind of piques your interest and you think, I, I got to find out a little more about that. And then you realize, I got the internet in my pocket, so you pull your phone out and you start researching it a little bit. Well, that happened to me the other day, which I think may mean I'm a nerd when you understand what it was, but I heard that they used to call pastors clerics. That was a common phrase kind of back in the Middle Ages, and I thought, well, what's that about? What's that even mean, clerics? And you know, today we think about a cleric being a, a member of the clergy. That may be something you consider that way, like a Muslim cleric in particular. Sometimes high church denominations, like Lutherans, I think sometimes still call them clerics or Presbyterians. But I was interested, what, what does that mean? Like, what's the root of that? And the word cleric is actually a Latin phrase that talks about reading glasses. So this is a cleric. You know, the kind you put down on the end of your nose, that's a cleric. Uh, and the reason they called part of the clergy clerics was because in those days... Uh, most people couldn't read. They were illiterate. A lot of illiter literacy rates were really high. So the pastors were among the only people in the community who could read. So people couldn't read the Bible for themselves and know what God wanted for them. So the clerics, the reading glasses, would read the Bible. They'd read the words of God, and they would give that to the people who couldn't read so they were able to do it. Well, because of Christians, actually, 
Uh, they, the school systems began to be created. Education began to be for the common man. And the everyday person could begin to read. So now most people can read. So pastors are kind of out of a job. And so somewhere along the line, we changed the name. We stopped using reading glasses for our name. We started using pastors and ministers because that kind of made the role make a little more sense. Now, if you've got to give me a title, I would just prefer Andy. Don't, I don't, I'm not a big title guy. Mom calls me Andy. Andy works for me. Just call me Andy. But if you've got to give me a title, I think cleric might be fun. So we can kind of throw that around and consider it. That seems like maybe kind of fun, a fun title. But I do think it makes more biblical sense than calling us pastors or calling us ministers, honestly. I don't get offended by any of that. But, but it's not the pastor's job to pastor people. It's all of our jobs to pastor people. It's all of our jobs to bring ministry to the church. And somehow we've gotten a little confused on that, and I think the name hasn't helped. If you have a Bible there in Ephesians 4, it gives us a clear picture of this. Ephesians 4 talks about leaders in the church and what their job is. Ephesians 4.11 says, So Christ Christ himself gave the church leaders, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And what was their role? He gives it to us right here in Ephesians. Their role is to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So my job as a, as a pastor, as a leader in the church, is to, to build up people, to build up you, so that you can do works of service in the church and in the community, so that the body of Christ is built up and so that the world gets served. You'll know I'm doing my ministry well if you're doing your ministry well. And conversely, if you're not doing your ministry well, that's not necessarily a failure on your part. It's a failure on my part. I'm not doing my ministry well if you're not doing your ministry well. And we've missed out on that. The Bible says that God, when he designed you, when he designed me, he had a role for each of us to play. And the role came first. Like He, he had a plan for you, and then he designed you a certain way. And then when you, if you gave your life to Christ, when his spirit comes on you, there's gifts involved. And those gifts are designed to give you uh, the, live out your purpose. And God's pretty adamant that we'd figure this out. 1 Corinthians 12 says, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. God's goal for you, in terms of the gifts of the Spirit, is that you're not unaware, you're not uninformed, you're you're not ignorant, some translations say. God wants you to know, He designed you a certain way, He put certain gifts in your life, He put certain spiritual impact, He wants you to know what those are. That's your job. Later on that chapter it says, now to each one of us, every one of us, The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So all of us have something, and it's designed for the common good, that we benefit the whole church. It says all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and God distributes each of them, them to each one of us, just as He determines. So I want you to see, this is not God mass-producing people. This is God designing you. The the psalm says He creates us in our mother's womb, and knits us together, and then the Spirit of God comes on us when we receive Christ, and so then... That spirit is designed to work in us to live out this purpose God has for us. And he said, I don't want you to be unaware of what that is. You need to know how God's designed you. It's pretty important for us. You know, I've been watching the building process out here in the field. I don't know if you've been watching that or not. You can go on our website and click on the Trusting the Promise page, and there's a camera that has a time-lapse deal. You can see what's going on just on some random day. What are they doing today? You You can get on our website and find that out. It's a little addicting, I want to warn you about that, but you can do that and see what's going on and all of that. And I've noticed that all the different tools they have, each have a very specific role. So like dump trucks are, aren't very good at spreading gravel. They can bring the gravel in and dump it, but they're not very good at moving it around. And rollers aren't very good at digging, and excavators can't haul very much. Like if you had to get the gravel from the quarry using an excavator, one scoop at a time, driving down the highway at five miles an hour, it'd take you a long time to do that. But you put them in the right places, and they all work great. Like in the right place, excavators are fantastic at digging holes and trenches, and rollers can pack the gravel amazingly well, and dump trucks are great at bringing gravel to the site. Like in the right spot, they all do really well. The same is true for us. The Bible says we're not, the church is not an organization. The Bible compares the church to a body, and the body functions as each part knows what its role is and does it well. I would say today that church leaders, and I take responsibility for this, we're not doing such a good job with this. I saw one study that said 87% of Christians in America, 87% of Christians in America don't know what their spot is. You know, 1 Corinthians says, don't be ignorant about the gifts. 87% it said, don't know what those gifts are. The ones that God picked out for you, the ones that God designed with you in mind. 
Now, and I don't blame you for that. I blame me for that. It's my job to, to, to help you with that. And so we want to. We provided all kinds of opportunities for that. You know, to, in fact, today's life track is exactly designed to answer that question. If you're saying, I'm in the 87%, I don't know what my role is, then your perfect timing. Stay after the service, go up the ramp. Life track will give you a real clear picture of what it is that, that you can do. Another thing is the, the ministry fair. You heard them announce that a minute ago. The ministry fair is designed to help you find a spot so you can begin to try things out and say, is this a, a gift of mine? If you try it and it's not, try something else. In fact, we're going we're gonna to finish this part of the service early today so that you can spend the last 10 or 15 minutes out there looking around. Now, your kids won't be done yet. We're, the, the children's ministry goes on like regular time, so don't, don't be that guy and need to go pick your kids up early. You're going to interrupt what they're doing. And for an emergency, of course, you have to. But don't do that unless you just have to. So I really figured like, you have two options. You can be bored for 10 or 15 minutes, or you can at least go look around. You don't have to sign up for something. Just go look around and see what options there are out there because we want to help you. It's a driving passion of mine to make our stat lower than 87%. I want you to know what your spot is because God designed you with a purpose. God designed you with specific things in mind. And he wants you to see what that is. And there's no small roles. You know, your body functions the way it does, and there's no small parts in your body. If your kidneys don't, don't work right, nothing else works right. If your liver doesn't work right, nothing else works right. There's no small parts. I get to considering that, that stat. What would a construction site look like if 87% of the equipment didn't know what it was doing? Some might say duplex road is what it would look like, but that's a whole separate issue. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Don't pass that on at City Hall. But some might say that. In fact, that's not even true. I thought that was funny, but that's not even true. You drive down duplex, and it's real clear. I don't know what's going on out there, but they do. I mean, there's a plan in place. And, and the reality is the Bible says the church is a body, and if 80 or 7% of your body didn't know what it was doing, you would either die or be severely impaired. Severely impaired. Now, I, I really believe one of the reasons that our, our world is in such a shape is not just because people are turned away from God, those aren't, who aren't in the church, but because the church is so severely impaired in this regard that it takes all of the energy of the church just to function itself, and there's no energy left to splash out into the community. But if each of us knew our part, it makes a powerful difference. Powerful difference. In fact, let me tell you this next verse. This is from Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus says, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. For unless I go away, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now that's a shocking statement. J.D. Greer says, can you imagine how shocked the disciples must have been to hear that? Because they'd been walking with Jesus. They knew how great it was to have Jesus right there in their midst. We don't know that, but they knew it. And Jesus said, as good as that is, he didn't downplay that, as good as it is for me to be right here with you, it's even better if I go away and the Spirit comes. Can you imagine, J.D. Greer asked, can you imagine what it must have been like to have Jesus in your life? Like you're, you're reading the Bible and you come to a passage you don't know, you ask God, he's right there beside you, and boom, God tells you, Jesus tells you, here's why it was written, here's what God had in mind, here's what that means. That'd be great. You, you, you forget to go to the store, and when you get home that night, you, all you have is one little TV dinner, and your kids are hungry, boom, Jesus blesses it, it feeds your whole family with 12 Tupperware things left over, right? You have a tough day at the office, boom, water turns into wine. Your dog dies, <laughs> your, your dog dies, boom, Jesus raised your dog from the dead, Right? Your cat dies, he helps you bury a hole for Fifi, right? <laughs> it's all good. I mean, it'd be great to have Jesus right there with us. And they knew that. We don't know, but he, they knew that. And Jesus said, as good as that is, it's even better for you if I leave. That's a powerful statement. Because what Jesus' point is, is if the Spirit is distributed among each of us, that's infinitely better than the Spirit all being concentrated in one vessel, even if that vessel is perfect like Jesus. As good as that is, it's better that he's among all of us. Scripture says when we find our place, it'll impact not just us, but the world. Look at, look at Ephesians 4. We just read, so Christ gave himself, gave the church leaders, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And then what happens when that happens? It says, then we'll all reach unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God. We'll become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We will attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, and that will dramatically impact our world. 
I think if churches did this, if every Christian found their spot and jumped into a, a way to, to live out that spirit in them, I think you'd see dramatic changes in our world, not just in churches, but it would splash out into the world. And you'd, see, you'd see the number of kids who are hungry going to bed at night go down completely. If not, if not completely, it'd go almost all away. The number of kids who need a foster care home or a number of kids who need adopted would just be eliminated because there'd be so many people wanting to express themselves that way. The number of kids struggling at school would be dramatically changed because Christians say, I know how to read. I know how to do basic math. Let me, let me help them out. I mean, right now, churches are so consumed covering just the basic needs in part because they're impaired that they don't have enough energy to splash out into the world. And that would change if we all had our spot. Our world has so many needs, not just because the world's broken, but because we're inefficient inside the churches. And when we find our place, it's a beautiful picture. Look, look at the last couple of chapter, verses of, of Ephesians 4. Verse 14 says, Then we'll no longer be infants, because we're all growing up in this way, no longer tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful schemes. Instead, we'll be speaking the truth in love, and we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And from Jesus, his leadership, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, will grow and build itself up in love as each part does its work. There's a part for you to play. There's a part for me to play. And this can be a beautiful picture when we begin to see what that looks like. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would be excited if Jesus became the mayor of Spring Hill? Anybody excited about that? Like Rick Graham's a friend of mine. He's a great guy. I think Duplex would get done faster if Jesus was the mayor of Spring Hill, right? I mean, how many of you would be excited if Jesus became the governor of Tennessee? That'd be pretty cool. Can you imagine how many people would flock from other states and move their corporate? I want to move my corporation to where Jesus is governor. That'd be pretty cool. I'll have him right there. I think it'd be pretty, pretty cool. What if he ran for president? Like if in the 2020 election, if President Trump and all 87 candidates said, you know, we're going to back out, Jesus can run unopposed, because who's going to run against Jesus, right? That's not going to work very well. If they all just said he can run unopposed, and we know the next four years are going to have Jesus as president, can you imagine how exciting that'd be for the church to know that he's going to be in charge now running this deal? If you're excited about that, and I would be, are you equally excited about the difference the church is going to make in the next four years in the life of our country? Because if you're not, you've not took Jesus' words in John 16, 7 to heart. Because Jesus said, as cool as it'd be for me to be president, it's even better if I go away. It's even better if my spirit goes out to each of you and you each have a, a role to play. I had a thought hit me that I never had considered before until this week. What would it have been like if you'd have lived during the time of Jesus, but not lived where he was at? So Jesus is there in the Middle East, he's traveling, he's teaching, he's loving, he's leading, he's healing, he's doing, but you're in Toledo. I mean, wouldn't that be like the worst thing ever? Like, I was there. I had an opportunity to be a part of that, but I missed it because I'm in, I mean, Toledo's bad enough on its own, but like, I was in Toledo, I missed the whole thing. I could have been right there with Jesus. We'll, we'll never know how cool it was to have Jesus walk with us. We, we won't, because he said when he comes back a second time, he's coming to shut the whole thing down. We'll never know how good that would be. But Jesus says, we can have a chance of something better. We can be a part of something better. Because he said, when I go, I'm going to send my spirit down, and he'll empower each of you with a specific thing for you to do. And how terrible is it going to be for us to get to heaven and realize we missed out on something better? I don't want that for any of us. And I want to know what it looks like for that 87% number to get flipped. So most of the church says, I know my spot, and I'm contributing not just to change things inside of this room. That'd be cool. I want to see Spring Hill change because of that. I want to see this area changed. I want to see, we, we found out just the other day, there's all these kids in, in Murray County that are requesting jetpacks, and there's not enough churches to provide them. I want to see that number go to zero. I want to see the homeless number in this area go to zero. I want to see the number of kids needing assistance in schools go to zero. I want to see the foster care go out of business because we take care of all of that. And you'll see that when churches stop having to spend all their energy just to fill the daily needs because they're just so impaired. But instead, every part has its work as he determines and we're able to go and make a difference in the world. And I want to be a part of that. 
and I want you to be a part of that, and I want to see what that would do in this community. So I'm to, to bring that to bear, I'm going to end early today. Hallelujah, right? So don't pick up your kids because that will mess up what they're doing. They're, they're having a whole thing. But I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. I'm going to pray for you, and then you can go out and look at the ministry fair and uh, look around. If you have questions, I'll be right here. would love to pray and talk with you. Let me pray for you, and then you'll be dismissed to the, to the courtyard. God, help us find our spot. Help us be a church that's no longer limping along, just governing the basic needs of ourselves. We're able to have extra energy to pour out in this community in ways that we've yet to touch as a church. We want that to be true. You've built us, you've designed us, you knit us together, you poured your spirit out on us, and that's better, Jesus says. Help us to see it. Help us to believe it and know it. And I pray that would start some today for, for so many of us. Pray in Jesus' name.